Hey everyone, welcome back to the deep dive. Today we're uh, we're diving into something that feels like well, science fiction flying cars. You sent over some really interesting articles about it, so uh, yeah, I'm ready to get into it. It's definitely more than just a Hollywood fantasy now. This technology is attracting some serious investment, and with that comes some pretty big questions. Can we make them actually work? You know, reliably. Can we make yeah. them safe? And can we make them accessible to everyone? And honestly. That's just scratching the surface. Okay, so no pressure, flying car companies. You mentioned this tech is moving fast. There was this Bloomberg article you sent, Dream or Disaster, something. It mentioned a company, Ehang, I think, in China. They're already doing test flights, right? Yeah, Ehang is a great example, actually, of how, well, how different parts of the world are approaching this whole flying car thing. They're already running passenger flights over in China. They've even gotten approval to start mass production. Oh, hold on, mass production. That's That's serious. Are we talking, like, empty skies here or are there actual paying customers? Actual customers, yeah. Oh. I think tourism, at least for now. There's this company, Shishan <laughs> yeah. Tourism. They've already ordered 50 Ehang flying taxis and they're planning to add hundreds more apparently. It seems like they see this as, I don't know, like a game changer for their business and the Chinese government seems to be completely on board with it. Interesting. And, and you know, while we're on the subject of Ehang, that Bloomberg article mentioned something about them projecting, get this, 50% operating margins. Now, I'm I'm no financial expert, but that number kind of blew my mind. What what does that even mean for, you know, for regular people who might want to actually ride in one of these air taxis one day? That's that's the big question, right? I mean, a 50% margin, that suggests that uh, potentially at least the operating costs could be way lower than traditional airlines which, you know, theoretically that could lead to much more affordable fares for passengers. Right. Of course, whether that actually happens, you know, in the real world, that remains to be seen. Right, right. Okay, so I'm I'm seeing dollar signs here, but then I remember reading about those pilotless taxis that Boeing's Whisk is working on. And suddenly affordable feels, well, pretty far off if we're talking about, you know, self-flying machines. Yeah, that's the, it's a trade-off, isn't it? Whisk is essentially betting that autonomous flight is the key to making this technology, you know, truly scalable and actually affordable for the average person. But as you said, there's a huge if here, and that's safety. Exactly. And not everyone's sold on the whole safety thing. You know, that Bloomberg article quoted this guy, Robert Joslin, an ex-Marine. He was saying, basically, that you just can't program a machine for every possible thing that could go wrong up in the air. And, and honestly, he's got a point, right? Oh, absolutely. And that's where that whole miracle on the Hudson thing becomes such a powerful example, right? Remember how Captain Sullenberger landed that plane on the river. It was like this perfect storm of mechanical failure and and just incredible quick thinking. That's something that, I mean, even the most sophisticated AI, it might just not be able to replicate that. Right. Yeah. So are there are there any strategies that they're working on to like address those concerns? How do you even begin to bridge the gap between what a machine can do and what a human pilot would do in a real crisis? Well, one thing they're really focusing on is machine learning. So they're basically feeding tons and tons of data into AI systems. Mm. And the hope is that they can create these algorithms that can actually adapt and respond to, well, even situations that they haven't specifically been programmed for. They're essentially trying to teach these machines to, to think like pilots. So instead of trying to like hard code every possible scenario, which, I mean, let's face it, seems kind of impossible, they're building AI that can learn and, and react on the fly. That's, that's a tall order. It is. It is a tall order. And that's why this whole this whole regulatory landscape is so important. These companies like like Whisk, they get it. They know that public trust, that's the whole game, right? And that hinges on proving that these systems, they're safe. Even when something totally unexpected happens, they got to convince, you know, not just skeptical ex-Marines, but, but regulators all over the world. Yeah. And those regulators, they've got their work cut out for them. It feels like every other week there's a new company jumping into this flying car race, right? That Bloomberg article, it mentioned Joby, there was Archer, both promising these quick trips across cities. It's getting crowded up there. Oh, yeah. And what's interesting is the variety, you know, you've got your startups like like Jovi and Archer. They're bringing these fresh perspectives. They can move fast. But then you've got the big players like your Boeings of the world with decades of experience. And they're shifting gears, trying to grab a piece of this this potential trillion dollar pie. A trillion dollar market. Right. Which actually, you know, before we were talking about those affordable fares and it got me thinking, Affordable for who exactly? Are we are we talking about a world where we're all going to be zipping around in our own personal flying cars, or is this going to be you know another another luxury for the super rich? That 
That is the trillion dollar question, isn't it? And yeah. it's one we really need to be asking right now. Because, I mean, if this technology is really going to revolutionize transportation, if yeah. it's going to be a game changer, it needs to be accessible to everyone, not just a select few. I mean, otherwise, we risk making those inequalities even worse, right? Mm -hmm. We end up with a world where the wealthy are literally living on a different plane. Literally, yeah. Uh, okay, bad pun intended. But, mm -hmm. but seriously, though, what about the environmental impact of all this? Think about it. Thousands of these things buzzing around. That can't be good for the planet. Oh, for sure. That's that's a crucial part of the whole equation. The good news is most of the designs out there, they're leaning towards electric propulsion, which, you know, it's a good start if we're talking about reducing emissions. But we got to look at the bigger picture, right? What about the environmental cost of manufacturing all those batteries? Where's the electricity coming from that's powering these things? It all factors in a truly sustainable, you know, flying car future. That's going to depend on clean energy. And, and a real commitment to minimizing the overall environmental impact. Right. It's like with flying cars, we're not just talking about, you know, a, a new way to get to work. We're talking about rethinking how we design our cities, how we consume energy. Even, even social equity comes into play. Exactly. It's a whole ecosystem, not just a product. I mean, think about it. If, if we're even talking about mass adoption here, we're going to need somewhere for these things to land. Right. We can't all just have our own personal helipads, right? The article, it mentioned something called uh, vertiports. What are, what are those? The vertiports, those are basically like airports, but, you know, specifically designed for these, these vertical takeoff and landing vehicles. The tricky part is figuring out how to integrate them into cities that already exist, maybe rooftop vertiports, mm. or integrating them into existing transportation hubs. It's going to require a whole new way of thinking about urban planning. Uh, I can just imagine those zoning board meetings now. Right. Public acceptance, that's going to be huge. People, by nature, they don't love change, mm. especially when it involves, you know, flying cars potentially zipping over their houses. Yeah, yeah. I guess that's where the design comes in. The article mentioned those bright yellow whisk taxis, and it almost seems like they're going for this like friendly, approachable look. Oh, absolutely. It's not just about how it works. It's about the psychology of it. They want these vehicles to feel safe, familiar, mm -hmm. maybe even a little bit, you know, cute. Think about it. If you had to choose, would you rather get into a sleek black kind of, I don't know, military looking aircraft yeah. or a bright yellow one that looks like it belongs in a Pixar movie? It's funny, though, how much of this comes down to psychology. It's not just the technology. It's how people perceive it, how it fits into their lives. It's true, though. You know, if it doesn't resonate with people, it's a non-starter. For sure. For sure. And, you know, it's interesting. We've talked about some of the big players here in the U.S., right? Boeing, Joby Archer. But then you have Ehang over in China, and they're already racking up orders. It's like they're playing a whole different game. Yeah, it's a good point. It seems like China's approach to, to innovation and regulation, it's just different. Yeah. You know what I mean? They often seem to prioritize speed and scale, which, which makes sense if you think about it. It can give them a real advantage early on. But is that always a good thing, though? I mean, earlier we were talking about the importance of public trust, right, especially with these autonomous vehicles. So if they're moving that fast, does that come at a cost? Yeah, that's the million-dollar question, isn't it? Yeah. And ultimately, it's something consumers are going to have to to think about. You yep. know, a company can get a product out there really fast, but what about safety? What about reliability? Will those standards, will they meet global expectations? I mean, these are things we have to consider. So to recap for everyone listening, we've got these incredible technological advances, obviously. But we also have to factor in the environmental impact. And then there are all these ethical questions we've been talking about. And on top of all that, you've got this global competition thing. It's like uh -huh. flying cars are making us rethink everything, not just how we get around, but but our whole way of life. I think that's exactly it. Flying cars, they're not just some shiny new gadget. Mm -hmm. They really do represent this fundamental shift. And it makes us think about what we really value, right? Mm -hmm. Is it speed? Convenience? What about sustainability? Equity? And then you've got this whole other layer. This question of how much control are we willing to give up to technology? And what are the consequences of that? I mean, it's, it's a lot. It really is. This deep dive, honestly, it feels like we just scratched the surface. We did cover a lot of ground, though. <laughs> yeah. You're right. It is just the beginning. I think the big question is, where do we go from here? Exactly. So for everyone listening, for everyone who's looking up at the sky right now with a mix of, I don't know, wonder and maybe a little bit of fear, we'll leave you with this. What happens when flying cars become as normal as, as smartphones? How does that change our cities, our relationships, even our sense of self? Thanks for joining us on this high-flying adventure, everyone. Until next time, keep your eyes on the skies.